Okay. Uh, my talk complements the essay I wrote in the Guimard catalog, which I encourage you to read and purchase. And this essay, uh, this essay studied how Guimard's works were clustered, and uh, I'm sorry, were clustered in sections of Auteuil with uh, specific growth patterns and visual and social identities to which Guimard responded and reshaped in return. And here is an example. The Castel Béranger, who is, which we um, now start knowing quite well, uh, uh, fitted right into the character of the Rue La Fontaine. You see a postcard from the same time period as when Guimard designed the uh, Castel Béranger. Uh, it was a former country lane uh, which had little in common with the relentlessly uniform avenues which had been devised by Baron Haussmann in central Paris. And the, you can see that the Castel Béranger is taller than the houses, existing houses, but it mixes a number of materials. It has a kind of rustic and bucolic feeling, and which uh, is very much into the uh, idea. When you go to the Rue La Fontaine today, it's still not a straight road. It kind of meanders, and uh, it's quite exciting to walk there. So here is uh, 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 the map. It's a version in 1900 map, which shows the condition, the edge condition of Auteuil at the time. It's really important to see that it was uh, closed by the fortification which had been built by Thiers in the 1840s. And uh, another uh, important uh, boundary uh, was the railroad viaduct which separated this neighborhood called Le Point du Jour to some other neighborhoods in Auteuil. So now you don't see that, of course, uh, the uh, fortifications were dismantled right after World War I, but, and you know about that big race track of Auteuil, but it was completely separated from the neighborhood of Auteuil when Guimard started building uh, residences there. So here you can see that uh, also uh, a big uh, notion here for my talk is that Guimard's designs reflect how Auteuil's residential landscapes, plural, evolved from single-family homes to apartment buildings of increasing monumentality and luxury. Uh, so his early houses were located in what I call the villa cluster. So you've got José Jasdé, Delfo, Jasdé we've seen already, and they are pretty early in his career. And uh, they are very close to uh, the first residential enclave in uh, Auteuil, which was called Le Hameau Boileau. Hein? Boileau had famous writer of Boileau had a house there uh, at one point in Auteuil. And you can see here the advertisement, 1842, very early, uh, for the Hameau Boileau and the type of uh, uh, very rustic kind of uh, um, maison à colombage, uh, uh, or full colombage, <coughs> which uh, were advertised as a great place uh, to live. So it was the first villa enclave, and it was followed by a good number of them. So here you can see all the houses I'm going to talk about. Uh, Nozal, Benzara, we have seen already, uh, Guimard's own hotel, and this one, which we are going to see in a minute. So that gives you a sense of uh, the clustering and the location of those um, uh, uh, single-family homes Guimard designed in Auteuil. <coughs> so Auteuil had really a leafy environment. It was devoid of commerce and industry, but it was also devoid of public parks. So you had greenery on streets and uh, little gardens. And also there were institutions, I don't have time to look at all of them, but there were um, uh, a number of uh, clinics and um, schools, especially in the, uh, near the villa cluster. So what you see here by looking at this uh, uh, image, which actually is also in the catalog of Paul Sedi's 
1880s uh, villa on the Rue Arranger, which still exists but has been a little modified, is how much it really, I mean, uh, Guimard adopted and adapted a picturesque syntax of asymmetrical massing and fenestration, as well as polychrome, brick, and terracotta, and even a rubber stone called uh, Pierre Meulière here. So you can see the connection between the two. Sadie had traveled to England. He was one of his uh, architects. He worked uh, also on department stores. He's a very interesting original architect. Uh, because we don't have to forget that at that time there were a ton of interesting and original architects in uh, Paris besides Guimard, <coughs> and they are all worth uh, knowing a little better about. <coughs> so uh, here is uh, the, um, uh, so this is the Hotel Rosé, and what you can see, that's the plan for the hotel. It sits on the street just at the edge of one of those gated uh, communities. It's not a big house. Uh, it has a very compact plan, uh, and uh, it has a small garden and a small outbuilding, but it really catered to the bourgeois dream of possessing a freestanding home of one's own, which is still a very big dream in France. If you travel for France, you've seen how many people want to live in a single family home. So, uh, the arrival of the railroad, which was in the um, 1840s, 1850s, uh, led to um, uh, developing the, the Villa Montmorency, which we see here, which was a, um, a um, private uh, gated community which, has, which remains incredibly exclusive. Uh, you know, houses are by the millions of uh, euros. So right next to, uh, it was very close to the fortification, and uh, at the edge of this villa, here you can see it right there, is the house, the famous house, uh, built, uh, um, purchased by the Goncourt brothers just before the Franco-Prussian War. And Edmond de Goncourt held a very famous salon, uh, Le Grenier de Goncourt, uh, in this house which still exists, and to me it's a typical French house. It could be basically in every city in France. And um, so this is uh, very close to a house Guimard built, which has been demolished in the 60s without nobody caring about the demolition. It has been replaced by a gigantic apartment block. Uh, and that house has also a very interesting site condition because it's wedged between uh, the, um, the fortification. There was a barrière d'octroi right there to levy uh, taxes. And here is the train tracks, uh, which just, they, it's a, uh, a sunken viaduct, uh, sunken. And now it's been transformed into a green uh, wedge of space, but that still exists. So this may, you know, this is uh, where this house, the Hotel Roi, which is, was published in the uh, series of, obviously Guimard must have been proud of it because he published it in his series of promotion postcards, uh, which we have, we have uh, the Trius Museum has some of those postcards, not this one, but some of them. So, uh, continuing on houses built by Guimard, you can see uh, he experimented with uh, different typologies when it came to single family home. Uh, this is the Hotel Nozal, Paul Nozal being a very, uh, Mr. Nozal being a very important patron of uh, Guimard. This house was actually not in Auteuil itself, just at the edge of Passy. Passy was a little posher, had bigger houses. And uh, it was really a suburban estate. Uh, it tried to look like one. Uh, and, um, and it had a guard house. It had a fence along the street. There was actually a high school by Vaudremer on the other side where my mom went to school. <laughs> and uh, here is um, uh, the, so the, what's amazing, I'm not telling you this is the last um, master plan, but I found this in the Musée d'Orsay. The house was set back as much as possible. I don't think uh, you would be allowed to do this today, uh, to have your house wedged at the end of your lot. But what it tried to do is basically create one big facade and a garden as big as possible to create really the estate feeling. So that also, that's a subject which is not 
so well studied, but the site planning ability of uh, Guimarque was also quite significant. He knew that he wanted to create something very scenic, scenographic, and he did that through the undulation of his facade, but also through the way he would set his house and maximize the space uh, to sit. So here's the Hotel Mezzan, I think we've not told uh, a lot about it, but to me, I always think of this as a modern version of a very old uh, French prototype, which is the Hotel Particulier between uh, Court and Garden, entre Cour et Jardin, although the court is very small and it's also to accommodate uh, the service side, and the garden, uh, you can see, you've seen already that picture, uh, and this was when the Rue La Fontaine was still uh, having very, very few apartment buildings and uh, re remained quite rural. The plan is extremely interesting and it shows uh, also the, no the notion of where are, you know, where are the space of service versus the space of reception. And you can see how the service is wedged on the side. It's kind of a, a strip there going from one side to the other, allowing you to get into the garden serving especially the uh, dining room. The kitchen is not that big. Another major feature is the hall, the two-story hall, which is not something you would have found in houses at the, in the very early 19th century in France. Uh, it can be either considered as a uh, boring from English homes or like Nicolas said, it could also be considered as a feature of department stores uh, where Mr. Mezara <coughs> wanted to be his house, a showcase of uh, the fabrics and uh, lace which he did. So it's, a, it's an interesting way to see how uh, Guimard borrows from tradition but obviously adapts it and uh, knows how to maximize uh, site conditions. Same is true with his own house. Again, we saw this house quite a lot. Uh, it's not true to you. It's a, it's a modern picture. It has changed it a bit in terms of the fenestration. But and also, uh, we heard it called Rue Mozart, and uh, it was also Avenue Mozart. What I learned is that it changed names 19, oh, right after the house was built. And uh, I saw that uh, a, what the city of Paris you could rename a rue an avenue if it had been planted from beginning to end with trees. So that was, uh, and uh, Avenue Mozart has trees all along, and some streets <laughs> do not. Okay, so that was the reason why, it, I mean, Avenue is more status conscious than rue, so that's what it was also called. But here I wanted to attract your attention to the fact that uh, it's a very small corner lot, as you can see, and uh, Guimard forms the facade. It creates, it's hard to say it has two facades. It's almost like one folded into two different pieces with very interesting uh, corner uh, definition. And it does the same, it, it really makes the uh, four theater walls into a single visual unit. And then he borrows space from one carved out room to another. He's very good at maximizing uh, the shape and, and sense of uh, perspective from room to room. And what he does also in this building is installing an elevator, strange shape, and here, as a major vertical mean of circulation for Mr. and Mrs. Schema and their guests. The, uh, the stair is more like a service stair. He needed a service stair, he probably needed a stair anyway, but the stair is small and it's not meant to be a, um, a place of um, reception. So here is the service stair, the elevator. What I really, this is not the, term, uh, the uh, definite plan, but I found this and I thought it was absolutely amazing when it came here to the treatment of the boudoir, which is again, a very uh, typical French room for the lady of the house, and then her bathroom. Uh, I wish I had a bathroom like this, you know. Uh, <laughs> with, look at that um, uh, bathtub, isolated, create, you know, being a love, you know, just a love into uh, nestling into this. The sink and the toilet are separated. I mean, this is 
mean, that would have been one of the most fantastic bath rooms uh, ever built. Um, but uh, what's also important to say is that, um, obviously, in the history of modern architecture, private homes for neighbors, family, and oneself have been essential testing grounds uh, for architectural design. And it's not only Guimard, but think of, obviously, of Frank Lloyd Wright in Oak Park. Frank Lloyd Wright was a contemporary of Guimard. Or Le Corbusier in his native town of La Chaux de Fonds. So in Auteuil, uh, the fact you would test new ideas on single family home is not the privilege of Guimard. There are other architects, and I'm giving you just one example. Is one of his friends who lived actually on Rue Perrichon and built an apartment building there right across from the workshop. Uh, very little known person now, Joachim Richard, obviously less you know, but he, he designed this house, which still exists, has been a little modified, but this is from a preeminent uh, architectural magazine, La Construction Moderne, 1911, so same time period as the Hotel Guimard. You can see how it was built, reinforced concrete, uh, with some very interesting uh, cantilevers and uh, ideas. Huh? And in fields, uh, I mean, it was also what uh, Auguste Ferret would do at the same time, but the, um, uh, the decor is quite magnificent. It's, uh, it, this house is still exists. It's owned by the Embassy of Algeria now, and yeah. <laughs> it's, uh, it has changed a tiny bit, but it's still one of those breakthroughs of the early uh, 20th century in Paris, which Auteuil allowed to build because you had space for both types of homes. Uh, but, however, uh, in Auteuil, the influx of uh, middle and upper class, middle, resi middle class residents, there were more and more people living in Auteuil, encouraged multi family construction. So that's what we're going to see now. And many, many, many years ago, uh, when I started my teaching career, I did this uh, uh, plate which shows uh, how um, apartment buildings. <laughs> Uh, the unit layouts uh, uh, are crossing over social classes while the number of uh, and size of rooms dwindles from grand luxe here, the very, very big apartment, to the very, very small economic apartment. So the idea is to show where the receptions are, where the kitchen are, where the bathroom are, is, and the notion that the Castel Béranger, which is a big uh, block, or a half block, uh, is in the middle, is a bourgeois apartment. Uh, it was a speculative apartment, it was what you call an immeuble de rapport, and it was really for the solid middle class tenants who could afford a living and dining space connected together, but uh, different, and, but they were not very large. Why, for instance, if you go to, uh, down the uh, social echelon and you see a building here by actually a friend of um, um, Guimard, Henri Sauvage, uh, you see that it only has one room for reception, which is basically a dining room, um, because that's where you know, the notion of salon parlor was not uh, so applicable for people of lesser means. But that's really important to see that um, um, it's, uh, it's a, uh, uh, Castel Béranger is a middle class apartment. Um, so it's also important to realize that uh, Guimard was one, just one among many architects who were eager to benefit from Auteuil's new and lucrative apartment market. And here I show an ex example from his older colleague, Mr. Boussard, who was also an architect for the postal administration who uh, erected absolutely bombastic luxe amenities and his own office and residence, like Guimard, in a narrow street which was leading from the Rue La Fontaine to the Avenue Mozart, so between the two residences. And that notion of impressing the neighbors, making something different, what we call épaté le bourgeois in French, uh, was very significant. And I think it's part of Guimard's idea, too. And the notion also of creating vestibules, uh, you pass the glass door and you've got this kind of very colorful, 
um, beautiful vestibule which takes you somewhere else, which is what Castel Beranger has. But this is also what Boussin did with actually more expensive materials as um, um, Guimard. So it's important to see that context. But it's absolutely true that, as evidence in the exhibition, that uh, the Castel Beranger placed Guimard in a league of his own. The comparison with Boussard helps us understand that he produced, that Guimard produced an organic total work of art. This is a notion we already have seen, where architecture, decoration, and furniture were addressed holistically. And actually in the exhibition, you have many plates of the Castel Beranger <coughs> album. I'm showing you one, I mean, Guimard really thought of his uh, Castel Beranger as a demonstration of his, everything he knew. Uh, so, uh, I would say that also that uh, maybe Guimard was a little less into social status than some of her, his uh, contemporaries and what he tried to bring in the Castel Béranger and which he still brings uh, both to residents and passers-by, it's a notion of lightness and uh, to be very light-hearted and having plenty of spirit and motion which is, uh, and, and light. That was very important. So Guimard did not revolutionize apartment design, but he put his personal imprint on auteur streetscapes in a few highly memorable facades. He excelled at addressing street intersections, which were so numerous in Paris. His stone and brick exteriors uh, evolved from Art Nouveau fluidity, which you see here in uh, the, an apartment building for Mr. Jasde, whose residence we've seen, to uh, something which you can deem more, arm, more angular and more art deco in the 1920s. So this apartment uh, with a apartment which is right across from the Hotel Guimard is not so well documented. I never found a plan. It would be very interesting to know how it was designed because it's such a narrow and sliver place and how it builds, the, you know, it celebrates the facade on the Avenue Mozart. It's quite exceptional and original. Okay, so the last apartment building which Guimard financed, no, I'm sorry, um, 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 uh, Otay gained um, a metropolitan momentum. It was becoming more Parisian than it used to be. Uh, and especially where the Castel Béranger was. So Guimard, across from, more or less diagonally across from the Castel Béranger, uh, was able to build this uh, very large, um, uh, a larger and presumably a profitable apartment block. Uh, this was part of, uh, uh, I think he used the money of his wife's uh, uh, family, and he had a consortium to build the Rue Moderne, and he, uh, not everything was built, but much, many of those uh, uh, blocks were built. And it's interesting because it's very tall, very high, uh, big windows, a few, um, there's a cafe and uh, there used to be a, a store that doesn't exist anymore. But um, it's all in stone, uh, it's a little later. Uh, and, uh, but when it comes to the plants themselves, you have actually uh, in the exhibition a, a plan, very well, the, um, very legible uh, plan for a two-bedroom apartment in one of those apartment <coughs> blocks. Uh, it's it's very bourgeois. It's very traditional in terms of its layout, with a gallery and a, an enfilade between the living and dining, the bedrooms and the kitchens. Even uh, the bathrooms are generally actually on the street side with uh, windows, but the kitchen remains uh, a place of service completely separated uh, with uh, its own uh, stair and its, its own uh, still very um, small courtyard. So it doesn't, uh, he, uh, the, the layout, the bourgeois layout of the apartment building is not really changed by Guimard. Uh, so this is his uh, last apartment in built and uh, finance and design and it's where he lived on the fourth floor on uh, another part of Auteuil uh, which is very um, totally non-commercial as opposed to the Avenue Mozart and very, um, very patrician 
And but the apartment building here is a three bay, one unit per floor apartment, which is uh, which I wanted to compare with this one, which is on Rue La Fontaine. So the overall uh, composition is not that different. I mean, obviously, uh, the, the fluidity of the stonework is is not the same, but you've got uh, a certain typology uh, which is respected here. What you see also is the, the, it's a one very large apartment per floor, which I call, and this has been cancelled here, but it's a appartement de reception. So this is a type of apartment which was meant for entertaining uh, with uh, a large bedroom, a salon, uh, the dining room, another salon here, uh, and the notion of a gallery kind of connecting. The kitchen being again, placed, wedged into, um, next to the service stair. There were two more bedrooms. What's interesting to see also, when you look at this apartment building, you've got a wonderful um, um, ending with uh, a kind of canopied uh, balcony uh, there. But in fact, when you look at the plans on the top floor, it's just, uh, it's not an apartment itself, it's just two uh, rather small units, which you could call garçonnières, actually. I, uh, they are a little bigger than maids' rooms, but they are not um, uh, real apartments. And that, uh, so Guimard did not adopt a new trend, which uh, was uh, seen here uh, by, in an apartment building uh, from just a few years <coughs> after his uh, Rue Henrienne. Uh, this is definitely a very modernist apartment influenced by Corbusier. Uh, there were others, but this one I think is particularly elegant. It was on the Avenue de Versailles, also close by. Uh, and what you see here is the notion, for instance, of a ribbon window adopted by um, uh, the architect, and also the fact that the top floor becomes the most desirable location with, uh, it's a penthouse, basically, it's actually two penthouses, and you can see the, the, uh, the openness of the rooms, uh, and even the kitchen is not so clustered, and you get a big panoramic uh, terrace. Uh, the, these pictures are taken from l'architecture d'aujourd'hui, and uh, you can see this is the new trend for apartment building, which actually is going to be continued uh, after World War II. So, um, now I, uh, I have three more slides, and uh, what I try to show is that uh, Guimard designed middle and upper middle class housing, and that's a little bit of a paradox, because we heard from uh, Sarovic <coughs> that he, he was left-leaning, he, he had very progressive ideas, but when it came to apartment buildings, he was still following uh, conventions. It would have been difficult not to follow them. Uh, but he also catered to uh, the children of less privileged residents in the uh, semi-industrial district of the Point du Jour, the one I showed you which was separated by the viaduct, and was kind of different from the rest of Auteuil because there were small industries and in, 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 in Guimard even built some for them, and there were small houses. So this, école, what is called École du Sacré-Cœur, is in fact a patronage. It's a place where the children of working class residents uh, would uh, go uh, when they were not in school. And then here you see what was next to it is philanthropic <coughs> housing built by um, 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 the Mulhouse, I mean, industrialists very tiny homes in very in small alleys like this. Uh, and this is another article from La Construction Moderne. This is from the 1890, late 1880s, just before Guimard. And uh, today, they still exist. They sell for a million euro. Uh, <laughs> and uh, I just think that it, would, you know, the, it can be compared to what uh, Barry is going to tell, uh, talk to us uh, uh, in a minute. So, uh, Auteuil, in Auteuil, um, low-rent housing, which used to be characterized, and I show that here, by a supervised uh, uh, courtyard entry. So, you don't have an entrance 
to the apartment building on the street, you go through that corridor, vaulted corridor, there's usually a concierge here, and you would enter through the courtyard. So there are only two of those in Auteuil. Uh, if you go to some other neighborhood, you have dozens of them. And they were actually not public housing, they were built by non-profits. So this was what affordable housing was for many, many years in Auteuil. Lately, they built, and it was extremely controversial, this is the, thing, the little railroad station which really gave rise to the urbanization of Auteuil. And they, uh, these are actually the apartment building on the um, fortification, which were I mean, pretty high-class buildings. And they built that big compound of mixed-use housing, which um, was very controversial. Uh, it took a very long time to build. Um, it, there were a lot of nimbyism against that. And uh, they are here, and you can see the type of architecture for those um, uh, subsidized um, uh, housing owned by the city of Paris. So, to finish, uh, Guimard's legacy in urban housing must be understood within its proper local and national context. Uh, and uh, undoubtedly, the Castel Beranger was a breakthrough in giving middle class tenants happiness and comfort beyond their means. One takeaway I'd like to highlight in this concluding slide is the advent of urban gardening, the flowering of balconies, which Guimard and his friends of the Nouveau Paris group here um, promoted. So this was a, a, a competition for um, balconies. People would not spend, you know, sometimes they were a chair, but they would, they were thinking really of using balconies to create uh, greenery. And this is a trend, if you've been to Paris, you've seen that everywhere. Every, people spend a fortune on their balconies. And even you see it at the uh, Castel Beranger. And this is an interesting apartment building very near the Castel Beranger by Reichen et Robert, quite well-known architects. Uh, that was actually at the very beginning of their career. And uh, it's an interesting take. I mean, it's obviously not inspired by Guimard, but they tried to make something a little different from the uh, modernist apartment. So um, the notion of uh, uh, the urban gardening, introducing nature into apartment building, where, wherever it's by the decoration itself, or this is by the planting, is very important. I mean, it's, you know, in France, when you, uh, the notion of introducing more greenery in Paris is, is an incredible debate right now, especially for global warming. So this is my last slide, and uh, hopefully you'll have questions and comments about my book. Thank you. So I was faced with the same dilemma of thank you, the same dilemma of not wanting to simply uh, read to you what I wrote in the catalog. I hope you'll read it, but instead I thought to contextualize it in a very large way. I have a very ample uh, photo gallery I want to show you. I might not get to the end given time, but we'll try. Uh, and so also like Isabel, I wanted to therefore give you a much broader context for Nima. I think one thing we're going to see is that were fascinated, as was Guimard, by inventing signature and seeming to be the only one. Uh, in fact, m much of his undertakings were part of much larger trends uh, with which, uh, in a kind of long durée with which many people were involved. Now, when uh, David and Sarah invited me to join the project, I was particularly interested by this uh, tension that I think we're talking about much through today, which I called signature versus standardization. Uh, and so, in that regard, uh, I wanted to look in particular at Guimard's interest in uh, prefabrication. This much later cartoon, I think, takes up the problem, uh, which has to do with style being time-bound and changing all the time, and prefabrication trying to come up with a universal solution that can be manufactured, replicated apart from its original creator, and which can be good for a long period of time. Now, just a little bit of autobiography here. In uh, 2008, I did a show on the history of prefabricated housing at MoMA under the title of Home Delivery. And although I had been a student intern <coughs> in the 1970s at the then relatively new Cooper Hewitt Museum on Upper Fifth Avenue, I had forgotten that my student task there had been to make a preliminary listing of the 
Guimard drawings that uh, Madame Guimard had donated to the museum. So it actually had these in my hands, and I forgot to include them in 2008. So thank you, Dan and Sarah, for letting me redress this unbelievable oversight. Uh, here we have it. I think we've already learned today that despite the invention even of a calligraphy for the style Guimard, uh, the Gima from the beginning between advertising, seeking patents, and creating systems of construction that could be made out of parts that could be assembled in different ways to achieve modifiable results beginning as early as his uh, competition winning uh, entry uh, for the uh, construction of the entrances to the, uh, to the metro, which is completely made up of prefabricated units. So by the time we get to the building that uh, is about uh, flashed on the screen, which is going to be my culminating point, the one Parisian built example of Guimard's prefabrication in the Square Jasmin. Uh, in fact, he has been through, as we've seen over and over today, and as you see in the exhibition, involved with what I would call as much the creation of systems as the creation of objects. Uh, and so that, I think, is perhaps already my key point. So if you want to tune out, you've already got the main point. <laughs> so we're ultimately going to get uh, to some of these documents which are in the exhibition. I would also say there's a wonderful video in the exhibition, yes. really wonderful. So I'm not going to explain to you in full detail uh, the technical aspects of it. I think you can watch that in a, uh, in a video in the exhibition. Uh, but these uh, mounted plates uh, that Guimard brought with him to America, I want to suggest at the very end that perhaps he was thinking that it was that aspect of his research that might have a future uh, in the U.S., but then also this slide, which I took when I went to visit the building and think about it, this is the building in the Square Jasmine, the single building made in a new system from a new company that he created in 1921, the building finished in 1922. So this is a prefabricated system signed with his signature. So that connection between creating a system which even other people can use and then creating a single block that would be tailored bespoke to his signature is something that completely fascinated me. Now you mustn't think that Guimard is a, uh, is a kind of pioneer in any way of prefabrication. And indeed we could argue that prefabrication is almost <coughs> as old as architecture, at least if we're thinking of parts. And I just want to give you a very quick uh, survey that's going to bring us quickly to the end of the 19th century uh, and put Guimard's system in some kind of um, context, both to understand where he fits in that long history, but also to understand what he adds to it, what is distinctive about his system and his way of thinking about it. In the top left, this aquarium photo is a photograph of an archaeological find in the Mediterranean of a prefabricated temple that was being sent by the Romans to their colony of Tunisia, but the ship sank. So the, tele the temple that was to be assembled in Tunisia uh, is in the bottom of the Mediterranean, but it tells us that the idea of the pre-making of parts really goes back to antiquity. But of course, much of this has to do with the rapid industrialization of building in the mid to late 19th century. And of course, the great erector set of all times, Joseph Paxson's Crystal Palace uh, in London for the World's Fair, temporary building, so permitted to be much more experimental uh, in 1851, entirely created out of standardized parts with a standardization of the assembly process. And we don't have that much, much photo documentation, but as important as the parts of Guimard's system when we get to it was his creation of a system of the way it would be erected and how it would actually reorganize the work site and the activities uh, of labor. I'm going to that in somewhat detail in the essay. But prefabrication, by the time of Guimard, even for the pr problem of housing as opposed to exhibition building, had already had any number of successes. Perhaps one of the first, uh, both to be patented and to be widely popular, was this one, the Manning Portable Cottage, uh, named for its inventor, Mr. Manning, a Quaker from Liverpool, uh, whose son emigrated to Australia, and along with him took on ship some of the first of Manning's portable cottages, a complete prefabricated uh, system of parts that could be assembled for any number of purposes, but most specifically for houses in a place where it was esteemed uh, that Europeans would not find adequate dwelling. Uh, this is actually the Quaker Meeting House in Adelaide, Australia, one of the first uh, of the many uh, cottages shipped from Liverpool um, to South Australia. Uh, and in fact, we know 
from them. These were advertised, not only in the London newspapers, but also in the South Australian record, uh, that uh, we know that, in, in fact, uh, several hundred of them arrived in, um, in Australia. They've also been identified as coming from Boston and from Singapore. So it was a form of prefabrication that was meant, in fact, to move with the British Empire. And in Barbados, interestingly, a different version was uh, created, which could be developed and used by emancipated slaves. So quite a fascinating story, even before uh, the American Civil War, long before Paxton's Crystal Palace. Now, what is fascinating about it, I did, when I did the exhibition in 2008 at MoMA, we went to the patent office in the US Patent Office and actually just found hundreds of patents from the 19th century for prefabricated buildings, often for rather lightweight structures like this portable uh, summer um, cottage. Now, I'm not wanting to go into their actual design, but the whole idea that one would <coughs> patent a design in relationship to signature. So what you own is actually the intellectual property of a system uh, that could be used uh, by others, but you hope in the end uh, to get some revenue from it. One of the most successful, although not so well known today in the US, was the Ducker House system uh, invented by a Brooklyn uh, entrepreneur uh, in 1888. He patented his invention, the Ducker Portable House. Also the idea of the portable house often uh, in the 19th century is that it can move through colonization or even through sites. Uh, they had offices in both New York and uh, London. Uh, there, uh, here you can see the, uh, the way it works. Uh, their catalog showed a variety of uses for their buildings, ranging from the utilitarian hospital hut to more elaborate garden buildings. They emphasized ease of transport, and they say that their buildings were, quote, light, durable, well-ventilated, warm in winter, cool in summer, beautiful, and cheap. It seems to be, uh, to be, in fact, a version, slightly modified for patent in the US, of a Danish system which was already underway. Um, and it, some claims that they could be assembled without skilled labor. So the whole problem, over and over again, about the relationship uh, to the labor market uh, is one that preoccupied, I think, uh, Guimard, too, uh, with his social conscience that we keep referring to. And we, one thing we're not treating today is him as a as an essayist and a pamphleteer. So there's the Ducker system. They were also could be used as uh, summer cottages. Uh, they ranged in price from $150 for the cheapest, the camp house, which was a substantial amount of money uh, at the time. But literally thousands of them were produced. Now to come to Chicago, which we all have, which will be something in this country of an epicenter of such thinking. Not surprising, given the rapid standard, uh, industrialization and standardization of so many things here, notably in the stockyards. Now, Frank Lloyd Wright famously produced kit houses for Ladies Home Journal. I won't dare go in front of all you Wright fans into too much detail uh, on Wright, but I wanted to emphasize the fact that by the turn of the century, it was not only possible to pick your magazine, even in what we would today call shelter magazines, but to order them from catalogs for mail delivery. So the relationship, too, to the development of the postal system and other delivery systems is extremely important. But the real threshold came with the invention of the assembly line at the Ford factory outside of Detroit around 1913. Uh -huh. Now Sears houses, Sears was selling houses by this point, not only uh, were they therefore sending their catalog and many of their objects by the mail, but you could literally get an entire house. That was where I took the term for my exhibition, home delivery. Uh, which was, ironically enough, uh, we staged it on the 100th anniversary of the delivery of the first Sears house. Between 1908 and 1940, Sears sold over 100,000 houses through their Modern Homes mail order catalog with 447 different models. Almost all of them used the balloon frame technique, which was nothing new in the United States. But the use on an industrial scale on site rather than through uh, delivery, was pioneered by others, notably by somebody who my friend and colleague, Isabel Gouné, knows a great deal about, uh, Grosvenor Atterbury, uh, and in particular in this extraordinarily beautiful suburb, which still exists in the borough of Queens in New York Forest Hills Gardens, sponsored by the Russell Sage Foundation, as an experiment in once in a kind of evolved garden city concept, but most particularly, we see down here by the uh, door, image of Grosvenor uh, for, uh, and some of the renderings to convince you to move, very much like Otoy, this is a railway uh, station that is, uh, the Long Island Railroad, that is going to uh, 
generate this. But what is of interest to us is not so much, and of course, designed, like so much prefabrication, designed to look traditional, designed to look as though it was not factory produced. And here, Grosvenor Atterbury began to experiment with a much larger scale uh, system, moving now into concrete, but on the sort of scale of Paxton, uh, to uh, work with uh, cast concrete panels. Uh, in part hollow with systems of clips to uh, join them uh, together. Uh, and uh, he then clad them often or disguised them with a kind of half timbering system so that they fit into this uh, uh, English Garden City uh, approach. Now here's the prototype house, which is almost more interesting because it's less dressed up. This is uh, actually uh, in, uh, in New Jersey where he designed these prototypes for what he was then going to deploy through various versions of row houses and different types of configurations, because throughout uh, with prefabrication is the notion of the invention of a system, uh, which is a kind of open system formally, uh, of which many variations, depending on family size, uh, layout, uh, the actual site, since the system is conceived as being unrelated to specific site conditions. Um, and this was to have an absolutely enormous uh, influence although it is rel relatively absent from larger surveys of architectural history, its descendants are much better known, unless we've all read Isabel Gournay's dissertation, uh, to which we'll get to the key conduit in just a moment. I want to point out to how important this was for something that's much more celebrated <coughs> in the history of architecture, which is in the 1920s, the enormous housing projects uh, by the left-leaning government of Frankfurt in Germany uh, with the architect Ernst May. Uh, which in turn then leads to a conduit with the uh, with the Soviet Union and prefabrication schemes there. But ironically enough, I think much of it coming out of these American ex explorations uh, with Grover Atterbury in the 20s. So that's Ernst May. Now the conduit for us, being that we're with Guimard and that we're also at the Alliance Française, uh, is this uh, a book uh, by, published in multiple volumes by Jacques Grébert, uh, the uh, French architect, on his observations of architecture in the United States with the fantastic uh, subtitle of Preuve de la Fausse Expansion du Génie Français. Uh, so, uh, of course, uh, that was going to be the main uh, outline. But there he um, took up and celebrated Grosvenor Atterbury's work, in particular, and many other aspects of the technical expertise of American architecture. So this uh, really, uh, right at the threshold uh, when our friend uh, Guimard, uh, you can see this is 1920, uh, right uh, in the months before Guimard is going to create his next company. So also we have to think of Guimard as a person who not only designs, but designs and invents uh, companies as both real estate developer, but also as developer of the fabrication systems for patentable uh, means of building kits, if you will. Now one la other eccentric uh, uh, experiment, I think, has to be brought in here, just if only for your entertainment. Uh, by, the, uh, by that point of his life, the world's leading holder of patents, Thomas Edison. Uh, you know him better for cinema and many other things, uh, light bulbs and light. But he also designed a completely different system for prefabricated, what he called the single poor uh, house. So rather than panel systems that Atterbury will come to much later, because here we are in 1908, uh, uh, Thomas Edison imagined that a formwork, a reusable formwork, so the panels were actually the formwork for pouring the uh, concrete, uh, could be created uh, on site, not thrown away as so much formwork was, uh, but rather um, this would allow for a machine that he had created, invented, also patented, which would uh, project the concrete up to this, this is not the chimney, this is the entry point for the concrete, which will then flow for decades before Rachel White Reed and the and, uh, contemporary artists into all of the, uh, <coughs> the crevices, the voids there, to create over a series of days with a system of pours and then uh, a short curing period, a complete house, which if you wanted the most sophisticated could even include a bathtub and an optional concrete piano that would be seamlessly <laughs> integrated uh, through the system. Uh, it was a series of molds, as I said, that could be brought to the construction site and therefore create one continuous pour that formed walls and floors alike with designated voids for windows and doors. 
There were four feet pours and then a cure. He did, in fact, build over 100 in and around Edison, New Jersey in uh, 1917, of which some are still standing. But severe cracking in many examples uh, manifested itself rather quickly, and the company was disbanded, amazingly, in 1942, just at the moment of another wave of prefabrication. Now, one last American example before we turn to France and finally get to Guimar, which is, of course, all day long, what you've been waiting for is Guimar in every turn. Uh, and that is, of course, to return us to Frank Lloyd Wright. You'll notice how many times the invention of the system involves also the placement of a newspaper advertisement for getting the word out, because, of course, we're not looking for a single client. We're looking for a buyer. So we also move in a very different way from what is the market for residential architecture. Some of these are probably very well known to you. Frank Lloyd Wright collaborating with the Arthur L. Richards factory in Milwaukee. Wright developed a series of standardized houses. So unlike the Ladies Home Journal, which is he's simply providing the plans, and it's up to someone else to actually create the house. Now he has developed a construction system of standardized houses made up of elements, largely wooden, that were pre-cut and shipped for assembly, reducing waste and labor costs, and advertising, as you can see here, uh, in the um, Chicago Sunday Tribune. You can own an American home, but not only is it American, but it's going to go on and explain to you that it's signed by Frank Lloyd Wright. So long before Star Architecture, uh, has given us architect-designed apartments in recent decades, this was a way to have a Frank Lloyd Wright and a much more affordable system. Wright produced over 960 drawings for the project, uh, more uh, than any other in the Frank Lloyd Wright archives, I can tell you, since I spent several years in them, uh, as well as moving them, detailing over 30 unit variations for this system. In 1917, more than a dozen licensed dealers so it's a system also of dealers, almost like Ford selling cars. Uh, this was going to be Richards selling the American systems built houses. Uh, a dozen licensed dealers of them opened for business, offering small units for $2,750 to $3,500, with larger ones ranging from five to up to uh, $10,000. Wright said, I would rather solve the small house problem than build anything else than I can think of. The United States' <laughs> entry into World War I soon would divert material. I some of the drawings, very beautiful drawings with these easily readable floor plans where your furniture is to show you that the furniture will fit in. Maybe you'll even buy the furniture that can be part of the system. And researchers in Wisconsin have been finding more and more standing examples. So here are some of them uh, in, uh, still standing in Milwaukee. As you can see, they can go from a large, more horizontal house uh, to this type of grow house uh, type. So let so we can say that by 1920, prefabrication had taken its place in the U.S. housing industry. Many were on purpose hard to distinguish from stick-built houses, but Wright was the first of the modern movement architects to want to exploit the system to create, I would say, a radically new architecture. So uh, with different types of floor plans, we're going to see that also emerging in a moment. So we might culminate our U.S. Uh, excursus here uh, by mentioning, and you can all go to YouTube to look at it, Buster Keaton's One Week. So when you achieve, uh, in a factory-produced film, of course, when you produce, I won't go into the plot, but go to YouTube and watch it, uh, particularly the sequence where the, uh, the ill construct, they don't follow the instruction manual, of course, they're not here. Uh, and, uh, a lot, but the point is really that it has entered enough of <coughs> popular culture that Buster Keaton can play with the ideas of the prefabricated house. So let's now turn to France, and let's turn to these two contemporaries, not exactly contemporary in age, but contemporary in practice, and in particular contemporary in the whole context, we're doing a deeper historical reading now, of the housing crisis produced, exacerbated by World War I. And the sense as World War I started uh, that it was going to be short-lived and there would be a housing replacement crisis almost immediately, particularly in the battle zones of, of Flanders. So that by, already by 1916, during the war, uh, Corbusier and Max Dubois uh, will patent, this is actually a patent file drawing for the famous uh, Domino uh, house. Uh, and just a few years later, by 1920, uh, one of the variants on the system, uh, Guimard, I'm not going to go into the technical parts of this, 
Guimar had uh, uh, multiple systems, but the system we're most interested in is a concrete or cement block system, uh, but there are also wooden variants as well. There are some examples in the exhibition and a few more in the uh, catalog. Uh, but these two also fit into a long history in France that goes well back into the 19th century, but just to take an immediate predecessor, uh, much less well known, um, is perhaps one of the most successful, uh, is the work of the architect Edouard Berard, who in 1918 filed a series of pat patents and then began quickly to deploy them in a system of a series of houses that still exist in Migène. This was a very important railroad junction uh, in uh, Burgundy with a lot of industry and therefore a need for more affordable but also for very rapid housing. Uh, and so this panelized system, uh, from 1905, he filed, filed already a pat patent for the first aspect of the system of construction using panels of reinforced concrete. Seven more patents followed from 1906 to 1911. Eighteen houses were built in Migène between 1908 and 1903, but examples have been found more recently in other parts of the region, notably at Auxerre and at Melun. So in, uh, and then in, by 1908, he wanted to go on and show that the system was not confined to housing, and so he built this, in the same system this uh, uh, extraordinary church of Notre Dame de l'Assomption. Uh, so interesting as well, he had a career. He was an architect en chef des monuments historiques. So Kant's working at once in monument conservation, but at the cutting edge of the industrialization or the invention of a system of construction. Now, this is so well known, but I want to at least bring it in, and I want to uh, particularly to emphasize, because I think Isabel has drawn so much attention to the aspect of, 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 of space planning uh, and the planning of, of Guimard's houses, uh, and that would be a real contrast with Corbusier's fascination with the domino system that he invents, not only to show us the various forms that that might take, because we're playing a game of dominoes, but in particular, that he's invented a system which makes no suggestion whatsoever of what the spatial layout will be. So this, of course, famously in the history of architecture is the enabling agent uh, for the development of the plan libre, uh, or the free plan, which is such a part of the Corusian architecture, uh, and I think a marked contrast from his older contemporary, uh, Guima. Just to give you some sense of the scale of it, this was a... Uh, uh, a mock-up of it that was done recently at the Venice Biennale in 2014. Give you some size and then some of Corbusier's drawings uh, for it. Uh, and here, one possible uh, layout. But of course, the thing that is very key here with this reinforced concrete frame is that there's no need for the floor plan on one floor to be anything like the floor plan uh, on another. And so here's some of these beautiful renderings uh, of how it might be. Uh, deployed on site, and quite differences between a, a hilltop site and a more urban site. So let us finally then conclude with this system that is so well explicated for you in the exhibition by the, um, uh, by the, in the video that I mentioned, because this is in fact the context for Guimard's invention of a system, and what a different system it is from Corbusier, which is really a kind of Hennebikian pouring in place uh, of a frame, Whereas uh, what Guimar wants to create is a kind of jigsaw puzzle of relatively small parts, particularly important because they do not require a great deal of industrial equipment on site. Both in the fabrication of them and in the deployment of them, they can be carried around by a single person. So they're actually relatively lightweight uh, pieces of material. It would seem he intended a publication of sorts from early on to judge by the near uniform layout of these beautiful sheets, which seem to be being prepared for a book, and also the mounted photographic record of the system, and it's used to construct a prototype house still standing today. So I have not visited the interior, but on the exterior, uh, virtually unchanged in a so-called square jasmin, uh, built in 1921-22. You see it here. And then what becomes fascinating, I think, for our whole day's discussion, uh, because we started with photo frames and small objects, is how that same language, although it's a now an extremely late moment to be trying to precast Art Nouveau, uh, which has kind of fallen out of fashion by this point, uh, into the block system, uh, although the ornament is really not in any way a constituent part of the assembly thinking, uh, or of it, but it is what brings Guimard's signature uh, to this system. 
And he has not only taken out some 11 to 12 patents for various aspects of this, but also he has invented his company of Standard Construction, or Standard Construction. Interesting to know that Atterbury had already had a company with a very similar name as referenced in Gribar's uh, book. So the key was that this was a hollow system of blocks of different designs in which would be inserted an iron rod. So think of it almost as a necklace onto which you're putting pearls, although the pearls in this case are decorated uh, concrete, which could then be filled with uh, some mortar to dry in place. But a minimum use of mortar was part of what he was trying to do, was to minimize the amount of work on site, even though he's building the building of small parts like traditional brick or um, stone construction. Uh, secondary systems of wood would be introduced for windows. So, uh, we might then conclude, he in a certain sense, he basically created an updated version of something we haven't looked at, the Cotentin system of hollowed bricks, which had been in use from the late 19th century. So, here just these are some of the photos that are in the uh, archive, and you see that he was very careful to document the stages of the assembly, so that you could actually, and interestingly, in this idea of the transportability, we might conclude by saying, and that little postscript I'll show you if we have time, that he was transporting <coughs> the idea across the ocean, or back across the ocean, uh, when they came in 1938, although by that point he was no longer doing this. This is a project that's now uh, almost two decades old, uh, but also the documentation of the construction of that party wall uh, house, uh, although the system could very well be used for a freestanding building. And showing, both in photographs I don't have here, of the, uh, of the place of the fabrication of these elements, and then you see uh, the uh, constructor uh, pouring in some of these uh, elements into the hollow grooves, uh, the way it could be built with a very uh, low-skilled labor. It was meant to be a foolproof system uh, that even uh, low-skilled labor uh, could um, achieve. So that leads us in with the paradoxical question, how could this socially minded person, in fact, be interested in a kind of de-skilling uh, of labor uh, on the site. So I think I'll just conclude there, but I want to hear some more of the details of what he was obviously preparing for publication, I think. Uh, photographs of the different elements of the system and the building as it's standing uh, today. Uh, in fact, although you can't go from one to the other, actually only a couple of hundred meters from uh, Courbusier's uh, Villa La Roche, uh, with, uh, built just a few years uh, later and quite close to everything that Isabel has just been showing us. So let me just give you my here, uh, but many, many elements for thinking about this. This is the system for a double house, for replacement housing in Flanders, but as an American, fascinating to think where is this going to go. This is Frank Lloyd Wright's later experimentation uh, with a system of construction uh, which uses partially hollowed bricks. Uh, expanding on a system that could actually be made on site uh, with metal uh, positioning and strengthening rods. And here you see, again, a house that you can almost build yourself. This is Frank Lloyd Wright uh, in the late 40s uh, and 50s uh, with the, uh, it's the Tompkins House in Cincinnati, 1953 to 55. An extremely different aesthetic, but actually technically quite related to what Guimar had done. I think Guimar brought those plates was during the war. The U.S. hadn't yet entered. Unfortunately, he would die before a short-lived explosion of prefabrication immediately after the Second World War as American armaments industry work factories were converted uh, to uh, briefly, with federal support, uh, to uh, the housing factories, creating a whole new generation of experimentation in which, in fact, the perennial problem that we saw already in what I've shown you, uh, do you create a small system of parts, or do you create a large system, either of large-scale panels or of full-scale modules, uh, and the debate to this day over what's called flat pack versus modular uh, continues. But almost every major figure would be involved with this, uh, Walter Gropius with his general panel systems in the 1950s, and even, as we discovered recently, Mies van der Rohe, with a steel prefabricated system prototyped in the uh, McCormick House, which is today the Elmhurst <coughs> Art Museum. So I'm going to end there and thank you.
your home, Isabel. And thank you for bringing us home here. <laughs> um, we have about 10 minutes for questions. Um, so I wanted to actually open the floor to you all if you had any right away. Okay, we've got one over here, Amy. Some of you may have touched on this. There was so much. I'm getting a little confused. But how did um, what is very important in the rebuilding of Chicago after the fire, the balloon frame, it fits into this somehow if you want whoever wants to address this. Can. Yeah. Well, either of us could. Uh, the balloon frame actually predates the Chicago fire. But um, it. Can um, you use the microphone? Oh. Yeah. The. Um, the balloon frame fits perfectly into it, but it actually predates the uh, Chicago fire. Obviously, it's a timber, it's a timber system of pre-cut wood parts that can be partially assembled on ground and then lifted. So it's like a barn raising, but it's a barn raising as a frame rather than a barn raising as a, uh, as a, solid, um, as a solid wall. It also fits into, uh, into this post-war US explosion because the critic, historian, activist for the modern movement, Siegfried Gideon, in his extremely influential book from 1938 to 40, Space, Time, and Architecture, had celebrated the balloon frame as part of the great American inventiveness, what he calls the sort of Yankee brilliance, and brought the, um, the balloon frame back into the debate, in a way, on industrializing. On the other hand, the French were very wary of wood construction and that's actually something I studied in my dissertation and uh, it has taken a very long time for wood construction to be uh, built for single family homes in France and usually it's not French wood which is used now. Mm -hmm. Although with it now in Paris you yeah, it's very huge but, yeah. thing to use. Yeah, but it's it's very it's recent. Uh, it was like when Levitt came to uh, build in the U uh, France, he had to build with cinder blocks because um, um, French authorities. I mean, nobody wanted them to, to have their house in wood in the early 1960s. It's changed now. Yeah. There was a question all the way in the very all back. The way So I guess this is more directed to Isabel, but either of you can, can chime in. Um, so it, it's very interesting to me, you, you, you begin this talk by talking about how, you know, French people aspire to live in a single family home, which is somewhat startling because in America, people often talk, of, Americans often say that, like, this obsession by middle and upper class people of living in a single family home is like an American or even like a broadly Anglo world pathology, and like that, that French people are much more comfortable with apartment living. And in fact, you probably know this, in the late 19th century in, in New York and Chicago, when apartments were started being marketed towards middle class people, they were marketed as French flats, yes, yes. right? Um, so c can you comment on, I guess, were the sort of social values about uh, and sort of acceptability of, of apartment living, was that changing in the late 19th and early 20th century in Paris? Like you showed these very luxurious apartments where people, upper middle class people, upper class people becoming more comfortable with apartment living? I, I think, uh, you know, what's interesting is that uh, there was, now it's not so much an issue of class, but an issue of preferences, lifestyle preferences. Uh, there are now people of any stratum of society who wants to live in a single family home and those who want to live in an apartment. And France is very divided between, I don't know if you heard about the new uh, controversy of what is called La France Moche, um, which is about uh, sub suburbia, um, street malls in France, but it also encompasses l'espace pavillonnaire and uh, so on and so forth. So there are ways in which uh, France is very divided, it's very divisive whether you like to live in a single family home or where you live in an apartment. Um, but um, when, you're, you're, when you're not in Paris or when you're not uh, in a very large city, um, everybody wants to live in a, in a house. More or less. But, but like, was that changing in the early 20th century, or is it kind of been the same? Uh, it, I, you know, now it's 
it's, it's, I mean, because mortgages, I mean, it, it's an issue also of financing. It's, uh, and we get uh, new construction methods which are very Americanized or maybe, you know, just standardized, which allow for a reduction of construction costs and uh, the ability, when you, the land is not expensive, you can really build. Um, I, I, you know, I, I've experienced that in where uh, my family comes from, and uh, it's, it's, it's pervasive, it's, it continues. Um, I, uh, I work at the Dreehouse Museum, and our visitors are really fascinated with his obsession with <coughs> signing his name on everything. <laughs> In the history of the prefab buildings and housing, is Guimard the only architect who would make sure to have a block with his signature on it? Do you know? I think that's a great question. <laughs> I, um, I've long been fascinated in the French context by when do architects sign their buildings. And yeah. I think anyone who's walked around Paris has noted how many apartment buildings, particularly from the Haussmannian period and beyond, let's say the second half of the 19th century, have a signature by an architect, almost inevitably an architect you've never heard of. So there's a kind of reverse relationship between signing your name and fame and uh, in, in this relationship. So Guimard is certainly not the first to be signing his buildings, but signing his buildings, uh, actually, uh, in a certain sense, having the signature produced not by chiseling by hand, but in a, in a factory mold, I can't think of anyone other than the fact that you could get your frankly right red square uh, who is trying to attach their <coughs> signature to standardization. It's yeah. a really great invitation to something to research. Yeah, and actually in Paris, you often have the name of a contractor also, one side you have the architect and the name of the contractor on the other side. And uh, so in this case, he claimed he was doing everything. <laughs> we have time for just one more question, if we have one right here. Thank you. I was just wondering if um, any of the houses that you were showing in your presentation um, houses, uh, apartment buildings, yeah. if they are open for visitors, or ah. and also if the details inside are mm, also unique to uh, Guimard, and also furniture, because you said... Castel Perranger, uh, if you uh, ask Nicolas, he would show you the... Uh, but I was uh, fortunate to be able to visit some apartments of Castel Perranger. We don't have, on the other hand, uh, you know, some places you've got a model apartment uh, in some of, uh, housing projects uh, that exist in Amsterdam, in Suren, and it's a fantastic um, initiative when uh, an apartment is being furnished. Uh, I live in Green Bank, Maryland, uh, which is a New Deal community, and our museum is a model house, which was completely refurnished as it was in the 30s, and the, the, uh, the uh, federal government sponsored uh, furniture which was built in Grand Rapids because people didn't have furniture. They came from rental homes or things. So this, uh, this would be fantastic if we could have a, uh, a apartment or, uh, somewhere, or even, uh, even if it was just a virtual apartment, mm -hmm. it would be a very good initiative. Yeah, thank you. Okay, so as we said, that's probably our last question, but you know what, we can keep on talking on the other side. Uh, so to wrap this up, I need to say a few things, so bear with me. First, we would like to absolutely thank all our guest speakers today. <laughs> is so valuable to us at the Alliance Francaise, but we also absolutely need our volunteers. You don't need to clap for everything, but I just want to mention, <laughs> yes, we have volunteers. They, they help us put a great program together. Uh, thank you to our technical team, uh, Mao, this morning, Maya, this afternoon. This is really important that you can see the PowerPoint. Uh, I just want to say we'll have a recording of today, so people who were not able to stay for the will 
um, day, Arnivo all day. Uh, we will have a recording, we will send it to everybody that was registered. It will end up on both our website as a YouTube playlist. Uh, for us, this is part of a larger uh, series of program about architecture. So on the program note, I think there's more coming up. Uh, our symposium on the French contemporary architecture uh, keeps going on November 2nd and November 9th. Uh, this is mainly about um, what international firms are building in France, the trend in France right now. Uh, the next one on November 2nd is with the, the design principle for KPF, James Von Klemperer, and the stock is titled From Chicago to Paris, Global Design and the Architecture of Place. So we, we go to another uh, century, but we know that uh, people like Hector Guimard influenced this century. So there you go, now we know that. Uh, and I remember a reminder also that our symposium is actually a fundraising event benefiting cultural and educational program here at the Alliance. Uh, last but not least, a list of everybody who spoke today uh, as is part of the catalog, and you can buy the catalog, I think, through a scan code or even a person today. So the catalog sales did happen earlier today. There's still plenty of copies at the museum. There is one person who purchased it, I think, yesterday, and I have your copy over here. Um, <laughs> and But there's plenty at the museum. The exhibition is still on, and it's open till November 5th. So you still have plenty of time, I'd say, to come visit. So merci beaucoup, merci beaucoup à vous, uh, to you all, for coming and exploring uh, the legacy of Hector Guimard. We'll keep doing that for sure for next year. <laughs>